Control, this is the G-Man. We are go for launch. And to the side, G. Gordon. All right, ladies and gentlemen, joining me now is a very special guest, Mr. Daniel Allen Butler. He's a maritime and military historian and uh, the, the author of uh, many books. Uh, he's uh, generally credited as being one of the best uh, experts on uh, maritime matters uh, writing today. And he is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Unsinkable, the full story of RMS Titanic. And uh, Mr. Butler, uh, welcome to the program. Thank you for sharing your time and uh, insights uh, with us into this uh, uh, historical uh, tragedy. Well, thank you for having me. It's, uh, it's, it's a genuine pleasure being here. Now, you know, over the course of uh, a thousand years, uh, thousands of ships have gone down. Uh, and uh, why is it, in your view, that uh, the Titanic uh, tragedy ha- has so gripped the imaginations of uh, the public throughout the world? What, what do you say makes it so distinctive? Well, you, you just hit the nail on the head uh, when you use the word tragedy uh, as, as, a start, as a starting point for this. If the, if the Titanic sinks, that's a disaster. But when she sinks and takes 1,500 lives with her, that is a tragedy. So that's where this fascination, that's, that's the starting point for this fascination uh, that, that people have had over the decades. But it runs a little deeper than that. When someone comes to the Titanic story and starts to, uh, to to really delve into it, inevitably they're going to reach a point where it's almost like an epiphany. There will be a particular person on board, a, a man, a woman, a passenger, a, a crewman. Uh, it's, it's never the same for any two people. Uh, exactly how they come to this point, but they, they reach a point where they find themselves relating to that specific person, uh, going, my God, that could be me. See, the Titanic disaster, the Titanic, the, 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 the whole episode, if you will, was pro- prob- probably, not probably, it certainly it was, the classic example of something terrible happening to a group of basically decent, good people. And these were ordinary people uh, that we can relate to who, under the circumstances, were asked to become extraordinary. And there's there's always someone that you encounter in the story who has decided that they are not going to simply blindly accept what is is being needed out to them. They're going to to, to go toe-to-toe with fate. They're going to fight for their lives or the lives of other people. And... This is how they became extraordinary. Uh, just, just to give you a couple examples, there is Jack Phillips, the wireless operator, who was tapping out a CQD when the power on the Titanic failed three minutes before she sank. Uh, there was uh, 18-year-old Daniel Marvin, who saw his bride uh, of three weeks, she was also 18, into a lifeboat, said... It's okay, little girl, you go, I'll stay a while. And then he stepped back onto the deck, knowing that he was never going, going to get into a lifeboat. It was the 39 engineers and assistant engineers who stayed down in the engine room until the very end. They made a conscious decision, knowing they were doing so at the cost of their own lives, in order to keep the power going, to keep the lights burning, to keep the, the electricity to the wireless. Uh, it, was the, it was the crewman who handed Minnie Coots his own life belt and said to her simply, remember me. And it wasn't until she was in the lifeboat that she realized that she'd never learned his name. These, these are the people who 
refuse to, as Dylan Thomas put it, go gentle into that good night. These are the people who were like Tennyson's Ulysses. They would strive to seek to find and not to yield. Yeah, they rage, rage against the dying of the light. And it was uh, what Ben Guggenheim who said that uh, uh, n- no one was going to die because Ben Guggenheim was a coward. Absolutely. It just it just uh, amazing the way th- uh, these people behaved. Of course, now Lord Ismay, uh, who uh, uh, got into a lifeboat, uh, as I recall, uh, was was thought very poorly of for the rest of his life because of that, wasn't he? It it ruined his reputation. Uh, if I may, if I may offer a, a minor correction, it wasn't Lord Ismay. Uh, Ismay was never elevated to the the nobility. It was simply J. Bruce Ismay. But he was the chairman of the White Star Line, the steamship company that owned the Titanic. Uh, and his conduct, while perhaps understandable uh, by modern standards. In the Edwardian period, his conduct was considered reprehensible. It's, it's debated exactly how he got into collapsible sea, the, the lifeboat that he got into. Uh, some people said there was no one else standing around, uh, so he simply saw an empty seat and took it. Uh, other people said that he shoved other passengers aside in order to get into the seat. Uh, either way, he violated the, the code of conduct that was expected of gentlemen uh, in that time in that they would willingly stay behind and risk death rather than uh, make an overt effort to, uh, to save themselves uh, and, and suffer the disgrace that Ismay suffered. He was, he was forced out of his position of the White Star Line and also at International Mercantile Marine uh, within two years. Uh, because he had become such a social pariah, uh, he, his, the people who had been his friends began to cut him mercilessly. Uh, he withdrew from society. Uh, he, was, he, he simply realized that, uh, uh, that he had made a, a colossal blunder in, in his conduct. His wife later said, uh, quote, the Titanic ruined our lives, end quote. Well, well. Now, uh, in your book, um, Unsinkable, the full story of Titanic, um, you, you give details of the, of the ship and how she was constructed and what have you. And you, you uh, go to great pains to point out that uh, it, it wasn't just, you know, the, uh, the first class section with the great staircase and what have you like that, but you, you go down to where the, the uh, second and third class people were, uh, they had uh, very neat accommodations, and uh, the food was, was very good. As a matter of fact, I think you said that the, the Irish uh, who were down there probably ate better than they had for, 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 for most of their lives. Uh, and, uh, you know, but the same time that they were going to, uh, the people who were um, building the ship and then modifying it at the last minute to prevent the sea spray from coming across the deck, of, you know, uh, in first class. At the same time they were doing that, they weren't putting on a sufficient light bolts to uh, to handle the passengers and crew. There just weren't enough lifeboats there. And, uh, and, but th- that still met the, uh, the, the legal specifications or whatever that would be f- uh, for going to sea. That's correct. The, 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 the Titanic actually uh, exceeded the required number of lifeboats uh, that, that were uh, specified by the British Board of Trade regulations uh, as, as they existed in 1912. Uh, the problem is, is this. The regulations specified that every ship over 10,000 tons should carry 16 lifeboats. And in this case, 16, 16 lifeboats worked out to a capacity uh, of, for the Titanic uh, of 968 people. Now, the White Star Line added, added a four additional boats that raised the capacity to 1,178 people. 
unfortunately, the Titanic could carry as many as 3,000 passengers and crew combined. Uh, on the night that she struck the iceberg, there were 2,207 people aboard her. So essentially what, what happened, what, when the, the accident occurred and Thomas Andrews, her builder, informed Captain Smith that the ship was going to sink, it was inevitable, it was irreversible, it could not be delayed. Uh, this was a death sentence for a thousand people. Uh, yet a, a, a tremendous amount of, of fuss is made over this. Uh, and it's it's overlooked, and what what gets overlooked is the fact that there was no ship on the North Atlantic passenger run that carried lifeboats for everybody that the that the ship could carry. The Titanic was not an ex- my, the point I'm making is the Titanic was not an exception in that case. The Titanic simply fell in line with every other ship that was in service. the The standard was usually between thirty and fifty percent. The reason for this is that it was never imagined there would be uh, a circumstance where everyone on board would be required to take to the boats simultaneously. It was believed that with the advent of wireless, ships could be summoned in time to a sinking vessel so that the the lifeboats would merely be used uh, to simply carry passengers and crews or crewmen in relays to the ships that had come to assist. Uh, so the the circumstance that it had obtained on the night of April 14th, 15th, was one that no one had imagined. So consequently, regulations that had been rent, actually written for ships a quarter of the Titanic size were still believed to be effective and uh, all that was necessary. All right. Well, uh, Mr. Butler, we need to take a pause uh, in our... Uh, very, very interesting conversation about your book, uh, Unsinkable. Uh, if, just for the benefit of our advertisers, if you can uh, just stand by uh, kindly for a few moments. We'll Standing get that taken take care of. I'm speaking with Daniel Allen Butler, uh, recognized as one of the, uh, the most expert and finest writers on maritime matters uh, in the world about his book, Unsinkable, the full story of RMS Titanic. And we'll be right back. And I'm in mid-conversation with uh, Mr. Daniel Allen Butler, the distinguished uh, author of uh, many uh, historical works. He's a very fine historian and is uh, credited with being one of the finest uh, writing on maritime uh, matters uh, alive today. And we're discussing his book, Unsinkable, the full story of RMS Titanic. And uh, Mr. Butler, we, uh, during the commercial break, we received uh, messages from uh, listeners with some questions for you. The first is, why did scientists think initially that Titanic did not split in half, even when eyewitnesses said they saw it split in half? And I think uh, there was another message that says in 18, 1985 it was found in two major pieces. Can you uh, respond to that? Uh, certainly. The reason that happened is that you, right before the Titanic sank, uh, about three minutes before she, she finally went under, uh, the power failed. So all the lights went out, and you had a night that had no moon, very, very bright stars, uh, but no moon. There was no source of illumination once the, uh, once the lights on the ship went out. So people were looking basically at a silhouette against the stars, uh, a black ship against a black starlit sky uh, sitting on a black sea. And depending on your perspective, on your, your point of view, where you were in relationship to the, to, to the ship, uh, you, you, in, from some positions, you would see the, the, the ship break up. From other positions, uh, the, the, the breakup would not be obvious. There was, a, there was an incredible amount of noise going on uh, as the, the, the ship was being stressed and as the, sh- as the ship was, going, was, was uh, actually breaking up. But this was a sound that these people had never heard before, so uh, they didn't. The, the, the people who later said they saw the ship go down intact uh, didn't realize that the noises that they were hearing, the booms, the bangs, the cracks, 
were the sound of a ship breaking up. They s- simply thought that it was the the interior furnishings shifting and and uh, and and moving down towards the bow. Uh, so it really depended on your point of view, it, what you saw, and it was nothing like the uh, the, the well illuminated uh, images that we saw, say, in the 1997 film Titanic. Obviously, for cinematic reasons, there there had to be uh, better lighting and, and more clarity as, of what was happening. Th- there was no light; it was pitch dark, so people were seeing shapes uh, that lacked detail. So they had to kind of fill in the blanks. And if you were in that perspective where you could not clearly see the ship break into, it was very easy to believe that she had gone down intact. So because there was this dispute, uh, there was no consistency, no uniformity, uh, no consensus, if you will, in the evidence given by the survivors uh, at, the, at, the two, um, at the two inquiries and uh, in, in their recollections to the press, the engineers of the day uh, concluded that the ship had gone down in one piece. Uh, that really had been the way that ships had sunk prior to the Titanic disaster. No one realized that the immense length of this ship, uh, remember she was 882 feet long, almost three football fields in length, uh, the immense length of this ship uh, was pushing uh, maritime construction into terra incognito, and the dynamics of, of sinking that had applied to smaller vessels uh, were no longer operable in the case of ships like the Lusitania, the Mauritania, the Olympic, the Titanic, and even larger ships that would, would come after. So it was a trick of the light or lack of light and point of view, and then uh, previous experience leading experts to come to faulty conclusions. I see. Now, uh, the Carpathia uh, pushed itself as, uh, all the way up to uh, uh, 17 knots, or I think, so, to, to try to rescue people. But wasn't there a ship that saw the, uh, the rockets and, and did nothing? Yes, there was. Um, you've, you've mentioned my book on the Titanic, Unsinkable, uh, a number of times. Now I'd like to mention my second book on the Titanic, uh, which is called The Other Side of the Night. The subtitle is The Carpathia, The Californian, and The Night the Titanic Was Lost. Uh, in this book, I tell the, the story of the night of April 14, 15, 1912, from the perspective of the two ships that were closest to the Titanic. Thank you, sir, so very much. We've run out of time. I really appreciate your giving us as much time as you were able to.